and I pay my respects to all Indigenous elders past, present and emerging. And I also pay my respects to any Indigenous um, people in the audience today. So today, I guess the objective of the panel discussion is to explore three profound and incredible multicultural businesses that I have had the pleasure of knowing um, across Western Australia that are doing incredible work in different sectors and different areas. Now, these panelists today are all multicultural young people across Western Australia. And essentially what this panel is going to do is it's going to explore some of the barriers, some of the strengths the weaknesses, the challenges that multicultural businesses have faced in terms of building um, their incredible initiative and coming to fruition, fruition and um, building incredible um, strengths and communities for Western Australia. So with me today, I have Ashvin, the co-founder of Man Up, Shinali, the co-founder of the Young Women's Boxing Project, and Nelly, the co-founder of How's Your Heart? So before we jump into the questions that I have for them, I guess I'm going to pass over to our panelists today to introduce themselves and their initiative, um, giving a brief overview of why they do what they do and who they are. I might pass over to Shanali first to introduce herself. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Shanali Pereira. Um, and just to, to, I guess, make clear, I'm not the co-founder of the Boxing Project, but I am one of the founding um, sort of members. I was at one of the first participants of the Boxing Project. So um, I'm an independent artist and facilitator working in the social impact sector and the Boxing Project I've had the honor of being a part of uh, for the last six years is a organization that runs free boxing classes for young women aged 16 to 25. And we combine boxing with social and mental health and with building community and mentorship for young women to find um, transitions past university, past high school into a community and to stay connected to their bodies and to sport. So it's bringing together boxing, it's bringing together community, and it's also bringing together, um, I guess, social impact, bringing together passion for change and for um, influencing the world and society that we live in. Thank you. Thanks for having me here today. Thank you so much, Shanali. And I have also had the pleasure of working with Shanali before, so I understand and I truly emphasize the beauty and the power of the boxing projects and everything that it has done, especially for young women of color. And I think that's something that definitely needs to be celebrated this Harmony Week. Um, I'd now like to pass the mic over to Ashvin to introduce Man Up. Awesome. Thanks, Ara. And thanks to the Launchpad team for having me here. Really appreciate it. Um, so essentially, yeah, similar to Shanali, I was um, one of the founding members when it came to Man Up, not necessarily just the co-founder. Um, but essentially what we do is we go to high schools around both Metro and rural WA, and we sort of deliver small group sessions to the young men about things such as, you know, what it actually means to be a man in today's context and how some ideas that we might hold on to from the past do sort of play out in a harmful way today. Uh, we also run topics on what are like relationships with young um, for young men with others, um, what respectful relationships look like, touching on things like boundary setting, communication, and consent. And then the last session we run is all about men's mental health. So we'll start, we'll sit down with the guys and we'll sort of break the ice by addressing the stigma around mental health, especially in sort of a young male context. And then we'll sort of dig a bit deeper and we'll provide some reactive and preventative strategies, strategies for them to look after their own mental health and also look out for their mates. And I guess so. Uh, the big thing about Man Up is because we deliver this sort of peer-to-peer -peer workshop style, a lot of the time when we do go to the schools, we'll break them down into small groups with their mates. And it's just a huge privilege for those guys to sort of let us into their friend group for an hour. And then we can sit there and have a chat with them. And a lot of the time our volunteers are maybe, you know, anywhere from one to four years older than them. So it's, it's very much you can relate to them, they can relate to you. And then you have a lot of fun and hopefully, you know, both sides learn a bit about it in, in the sort of hour that you're there. Thank you so much, Ashwin. Um, Man Up does some incredible work and I really do suggest um, everyone to search up their website afterwards. They are continuously breaking the stereotypes and the stigmas across Western Australia. I'll now pass the mic over to Nelly to introduce How's Your Heart. Thank you, Sarah. Um, much like Shanali and Ashwin, I was one of the founding members for How's Your Heart. 
Um, and essentially we um, run conversation circles and employ the taboo talks method. Um, and it's just essentially a safe space for um, young people of colour to come together and have safe discussions um, around topics that may necessarily not be spoken about or um, topics that may be considered um, taboo within CALD communities. Um, and it's it's been really well received by um, young people and a lot of the topics that we do speak about um, generally stem back to mental health. Awesome, thank you so much, Nelly. Um, I guess we'll jump into the Q&A portion of the panel discussion. And I also do wanna encourage all the audience members to write down their questions as we go on. If you have anything you'd like to ask the panel members, just drop them in the um, box below and we will get back to it in the final part of the panel discussion where we will have an open Q&A. So I guess we'll start with the why element of this Q&A portion. And I think that it is super important to explore that there are, that starting a small business often isn't the trajectory that many multicultural people take. I myself, especially as a young person from a migrant and refugee background, was um, pushed to take the traditional trajectory of life, which is go to university, study for a degree. And unfortunately, um, developing your own initiative doesn't necessarily fall under that traditional um, narrative of my life. So I wanna jump into um, the why you started your initiative. Ashvin, um, I'll start with you. The journey of Man Up starts with your own story of identifying to toxic masculine attitudes. Can you give us a rundown of how and why Man Up was developed? Absolutely. Yeah. So I guess toxic masculinity in itself is, especially recently, is very much a bit of a buzzword. Um, but I guess the, the definition that I'm sort of going to go with when we talk about Man Up is when we use traditional male attitudes and we apply them in today's context in sort of a position where they are not very welcomed. Um, so we do this activity with the students where we get them to think of what are some, you know, stereotypical attributes they may consider male and that you get things like, you know, aggressive or controlling or physically strong X, Y, Z. And I'm not to say you should never be aggressive because sure, if you're in a competitive sports game or hundred meter sprint or whatever, be as aggressive as you can. Um, it's all about just applying the right attitudes in the right context. And we, and we really do try to encourage them to take on a new, a more sort of reformed version of what it actually means to be a man. Um, and sort of this aspect of toxic masculinity, it does take many faces. I mean, for myself, I went to an all boys school and I guess toxic masculinity in itself, it's kind of everywhere you look, be that the attitudes and ideas around the women and non-binary people in our community, um, but also the attitudes and ideas on what, how you have to act or be, or what you have to say to be one of the like, top guys or to be a better man um, and I guess this was very much the norm for me and it was only until I left school and I joined uni I started interacting with people from new ideas and new backgrounds to actually realize that this is not really a healthy way to think um, to you know view women in this way or to you know think about yourself in this way is not sustainable when it comes to wanting to live a happy and healthy life and and then the alarming bit is there are so many other guys um, who had their own experience with it and everyone has it there's no one says anything about it um, but I guess what was cool is we all sort of came together and we all had our own angle of it. So some of us may have thought toxic masculinity from the aspect of we don't really like how some of our friends at school talk about or treat women. And others are, I don't really like how I hold myself to an unrealistic standard, which, you know, affects my mental health. Um, and so I guess with a multicultural lens on it as well. So I've got an Indian background um, and I'm very blessed where, you know, if I wanted to go to my dad or like my barber, for example, for emotional support, even though they may not, provide the best support with words I know the heartfelt you know intention would be there so I'm, I'm very lucky in that sense but I do know from a lot of friends in my community where that sort of you know male Indian figure has been one which is very stoic and stern and you know don't show emotion what you do is you go you know make money for the house do this do this do this um in a very traditional form of this masculinity and um you know man up in our community for example two-thirds of our executive are man up are from either India or Sri Lanka. Um, so it's, it's a pretty similar kind of vibe both ways. And I guess we can sort of connect on that aspect. And, and then even though we may have these things going on in our personal life, just because we can, we've can, we experienced what this toxic masculinity does look like and we've realised how fortunate we've been in our own lives, I guess we've just been more passionate to be able to hopefully apply that to our community and just you know have a chat with some guys and, and let them realise like what is going to be the new normal. 
beautifully worded, Ashvin, and I think I can definitely relate to you in terms of having parents who don't necessarily know how to um, translate their love for you through words. So I think that that was a beautiful sentiment to start off with your why. Um, I might pass over to you, Shanali, to explore the five-year long time period that you've had in developing or helping develop the boxing project. I know that it's been six years that you've been involved. So can you give us a rundown of how it has developed over time? Absolutely, thank you. So it's it's great to follow on from Ashwin because the boxing project, or at the time it was called the Young Boxing Woman Project, it was it started because women were angry and it was a space for young women to come together and talk about what had made them angry that week. And the boxing was an expression of aggression or anger that we often have to repress in, in society. We have to, um, we can't express in healthy ways. Um, and that was, you know, it was just a small group of us in a room, boxing for 45 minutes, sitting down to have a chat after, and it was very casual. Um, and I think that was the beauty of it is that the, the project itself, the founder, one of their, you know, strongholds was that it would be peer led, that it would be formed by the women that came to it. So we brought our own ideas, we brought our passion, and we brought our friends, which is how it grew. So um, starting from that one little session in Subiaco, we then went on to have um, over the years sessions in Coburn, in Willoughby, in Joondalup, um, and in a few other places, actually. I can't even remember all of them off the top of my head. But I think what's interesting, um, and then we also started going into schools. So I went from being a participant to training myself up to being a trainer. So I would run the sessions myself and obviously we'd have a new generation of young women coming in um, over the years. And then I went on to become a, a strategist for the project. So I was working at a more sort of um, management level, um, helping other trainers, but also running workshops in schools. So we started approaching both young women and men in schools to teach boxing. And it was really interesting to be um, a woman teaching boxing to young high school boys and the sort of assumptions that you'd come up against. Um, and also the how quickly boxing would break those assumptions, because as soon as you sort of, you know, you're boxing with me, you know that I can box. So it's sort of like, oh, all these assumptions you have about women and all these assumptions you have about boxing as well, about the way that we express ourselves through our body. Boxing and other martial arts, in my opinion, is actually an incredible expression of discipline of having control over your body, of emotional intelligence, of knowing what your boundaries are, knowing what your personal kind of space is and claiming your space. Um, and there are all these sort of misinterpretations of that in the society that we live in that equates um, violence and aggression, like makes that the same thing, whereas actually healthy anger is something that we need in our society and that we need to know how to express without hurting other people. Um, so over the years, it's gone from really expanding to this sort of, you know, larger community to once again coming through to a new generation. So the reason why I sort of emphasize that I've, you know, I've now like an alumni of the project is that, you know, I'm, I'm past 25 now. So there's a new generation that's reshaping the project and making it the space that they need it to be for themselves. So we've also, we've come, come back down to our group in Subiaco, we now have an online session, which is obviously um, a result of COVID, you know, happening in the last two years. So that's something that occurs regu regularly now. And we have people joining from um, sometimes from the other side of Australia as well. So I think the journey for me has been always listening to who comes into the room and sort of making sure that we're deeply connected to the needs of the people that we're servicing or the people that we're meant to be for. So, you know, that's something that I am really proud of is that the Boxing Project has, has been able to change and adapt with the times and the spaces that we move in. Um, yeah, and it's been a really interesting journey. And I think the one thing that I, I really, when I reflect back, the one thing that I have learned um, that I think is really powerful is to be aware of the cycle that you're moving in and to let go when you need to let go and to be aware of when you need to make space for yourself and also when you need to invite other people to the space and let other people have the space. So 
just being aware that change is inevitable and that you have to move with it. I love that, Shanali. And I've had the privilege of sitting on panel discussions with you before. And every time you speak, and I'm sure this is what everyone is thinking, you bring so much passion and so much courage, which I think is a testament of the work that you do at The Boxing Project, which I have seen um, in person and online. So I'm so proud and privileged to be in this space and sharing space with you today. Um, I might jump to Nelly now. Now, Nelly, I actually have watched your journey of how's your how develop. I've been on the sidelines. I've seen their consultations be held. And I do recognize that how's your how actually did kick off during COVID-19's outbreak. How did you navigate this? And how were you um, working towards the challenges of actively amplifying voices, experiencing an upsurge of mental health challenges, especially during the COVID outbreak. Yeah, it definitely was um, really tricky navigating all of that during COVID. Um, so before we launched the project, COVID wasn't a thing um, and we had big plans um, for How's Your How and then COVID came along and disrupted everything. Um, so for us as well, it was, trying to navigate the world of COVID and still, you know, carry out everything that we had planned and hoped and dreamed for How's Your Hull, um, while still engaging um, young people. And we recognised that during COVID, there was a massive, massive surge of um, young people um, of Cal backgrounds, particularly not knowing where to go for support um, and feeling quite isolated and lonely. Luckily for us, our initial um, consultations, we were able to still have them in person. Um, and then after that, we had to move things online. But having those initial consultations in person, I think really, really did help because it got, um, it allowed people to have a bit of a feel for um, what How's Your Heart is and how we have these conversations and just what the overall vibe and atmosphere of um, the conversation circles are. So when we did have to move it online, people kind of had an idea of what to expect. Um, it was definitely, you know, not easy um, for us as young people um, because it was, you know, we were trying to recognise and um, handle the challenges of COVID as young people ourselves, whilst also trying to support other young people. Um, fortunately, we had an amazing mentor who did um, guide us and support us through all of that. And for all the young people who did come to those initial in-person consultations, we really did see a lot of engagement um, and a lot of people reaching out to us being like, are you still going to continue this during COVID? Um, because initially we thought maybe we'll pop a hold onto it. Um, but when we saw that people were still really, really keen, um, we moved it all online and it was still able to progress um, a little bit differently to how we envisioned, but we still did it. Amazing. And power and courage and strength to you and your team, Nelly. Thank you for sharing. Um, the next section that I want to jump into is the how section. Now, I know that most of the time we do speak about our wins and our um, strengths and everything that comes successfully to our path towards creating change, but we never necessarily discuss how we have got to this point and what challenges and um, resources we need to establish ourselves to the point where we do start to see results flow through. So Ashvin, I might pass the mic over to you. You spoke earlier about how you started this initiative fresh out of university. Fresh out of university often means that you don't really have this, the resources um, to actually build yourself up to where you are right now. Um, how did you receive the necessary support to build Man Up into a state-based pronoun um, initiative? Thank you. Um Straight out of high school, actually, yeah, still very much in my in my uni career. It's almost never ending. But um, um, in terms of how we went about it, I think yeah, it was certainly difficult. I, I think similar to, to Nelly, when we first had the idea, well, like, this is gonna be really cool. We're gonna break into schools. We're gonna do loads of sessions, and then all the schools went into lockdown. Everything shut down. COVID happened, and we were all just sitting at home. So instantly, there was a there was a challenge there. Um, ended up being a bit of a blessing though, because. It was we were almost operating sort of cart before the horse in the sense that we had all these great ideas and because we do cover like quite a large niche in the school education system um we were really lucky that a lot of schools kind of bought into our vision um that was 
pretty like I would say pretty well before we'd actually established proper like peer review programs. Um, so it was almost a blessing because while we're all home, we could really develop building our community and our our online community, um, and then also just our internal systems, which meant that by the end of 2020, when we came into delivering sessions, um, it was sort of we could sort of hit the ground running, which is great. In terms of how do we go about it, I'll talk about sort of two aspects of it. First of all, on a personal side, about trying to balance, you know, the work you need to put in and then also helping this come afloat. Um, but then also on like a team side of things. So I guess on a personal side, um, so yeah, quite busy with uni and then other work. And then also, I guess, with the theme of, of this week coming from a multicultural background, it can be sometimes difficult to explain to, to grandparents, particularly my parents are very, very progressive. My mum does, you know, more social impact stuff than I do in your average week alongside, you know, working as a, as a full-time doctor, which is pretty impressive. Um, but you know, going to my grandparents' house for food and then being like, oh, like, how are your mark going? How's uni going? Oh, like, are you, are you going into uni, you know, to, um, this this week? Like, one of your labs, X, Y, Z, I'd be like, oh, no, like, I'm actually driving to the Swan Valley to go talk to some students about, you know, how to have sex properly or, like, safely or talk about to students about consent. And they're like, like, yeah, good on you, man, but don't you want to focus on your career? And it's, it's and it, it, you know, you can't hold it. That's just how things have been for so long. You know, they, they, they're the ones that came to Australia, and they've given me the amazing opportunity to actually have the free time to do stuff like this. Um, so I guess I've been lucky enough that I get support from my direct family to help me do things. Um, but for someone who may find that a bit more difficult, I just think by showing them how passionate you are for this project and really letting them buy into your vision um, is sort of a huge way to get that support, especially like, um, so I go to UWA and the uni has been so supportive of me. So when it comes to having to miss classes because I'm away, in rural WA for a trip or something like this. Um, I feel like when you're working in this social impact space, a lot of people might think that because you're doing something good, people will let you go off pretty easily, or like good things will happen to you. Um, but it doesn't exactly work like that. So yes, you may be doing something good, but everyone's doing something good when they're working, right? Everyone's contributing their way to the community. So you can't really just walk around and be like, oh, I'm going to miss uni. And then when I come back, I'll be like, oh, no, but like I was helping kids out. And so surely you'll understand. Um, so what I really suggest is just being proactive about it. So, you know, it's like I send a lot of emails to my, you know, unit coordinators at uni back and forth at the start of the semester, going in and in person and just putting a face to the name they're going to be receiving, you know, every couple of months um, and actually explaining like more to your story than just your student number saying, hey, look, yes, I'm very passionate about my degree, but this is what I'm also doing on the side. Um, and I'd really support, I really love a bit of two-way sort of movement with this. And then once you establish that relationship with whatever aspects you need support. So for me, that's uni. For some people, that might be a boss with work or um, members of their family, um, wherever it may be, as, as long as you sort of establish that relationship with them first and really let them buy into your vision. And look, if you're at the point where you're starting an initiative, you definitely, definitely have the passion for it. It's all about just, you know, communicating that across. And as soon as you can do that, you know, that's when you really do get their support because they're there with you. Um, and without that, it's very difficult to do. So I guess on an individual basis, the take, takeaway is um, you can't really expect that people are going to support you just because what you're doing may be a good thing. You really got to go to them, share the vision with them, share your passion with them. And then, you know, that will be, you know, rewarded as long as it's a two-way street. And then on a team side of things, I guess because of the nature of our, our organisation, which is all about supporting each other, you know, whenever someone's having a bad week or even if someone's, a bit off in a meeting, you'll probably get seven texts when you get home from different guys in that meeting. You're like, hey, mate, notice you're a bit, you weren't yourself today. Do you want some time off or do you need a chat? So I guess I've just been really fortunate that by doing this work, I've also been lucky enough to surround myself with some awesome guys and who are now some of my closest mates. So I guess that's sort of how I stay you know, happy and healthy um, alongside balancing these things here. Beautiful advice. Thank you so much, Ashwin. I know I'm definitely walking away with some of that advice as well. Um, Shanali, I might jump to you now. Since you have a plethora of experience over six years of it, can you run us through some of the biggest challenges that you've experienced in developing the boxing project? Absolutely. Um, I think the most obvious challenge, which is probably something you're going to hear from anyone working in the not-for-profit um, social impact sector is resources. So how do you find resources, whether it's money, whether it's spaces um, to, to sustain your initiative? And, you know, as passionate as the people working in the industry might be, passion alone is not going to take you very far. And actually most people burn out pretty quickly. 
Um, and I can personally say that I have also experienced burnout. So um, I think that is, that's not to normalize it. I think that's something that needs to change in the sector, um, but I, I see it everywhere. So I, I guess just stating the obvious that resources and burnout and a lot of people put, you know, they put their whole life into it and that ends up in burnout at the end. Um, in terms of resources, some of the most creative ways that we've, um, so with boxing at the start, no one wanted to support it. You know, the idea of women boxing and then free boxing classes for girls, it was just not an idea five years ago. That wasn't something that anyone wanted to support. Um, so we actually got all of our, we didn't have any funding when we started. We got all of our support in kind. Um, we had, at the time, it was the PCYC that agreed to give us the space. We had all of our gear donated to us from um, different gyms and um, different organizations. We were very lucky to have an international organization, Society9, um, give us a bunch of free gloves and pads. So that was all of our gear that we started out with. And we had volunteers. So um, I think the very first trainer was paid, but then when I came on board as a trainer, I was a volunteer. But the thing that fueled it at that time was that I was getting something out of it too. I was getting boxing, I was getting a workout twice a week, and I was also getting community. So it's about diversifying your resources and being really creative in how you um, find your resources. Eventually we started applying for funding, um, but we also came up with a model where we had adult women paying for boxing classes that would then fund the free program for young women. And this we found was a much more sustainable way of funding the program than going for like three month funding or six month, six month funding. Because in addition to, you know, actually getting the funding, there's a whole lot of um, stipulations that come with it. There's work that needs to go into writing grant applications. There's work that needs to go into equiting um, grant applications. And that is a full time job or that is at least a part time job, which is I think something that people don't take into account when they start their social enterprises, when they start their sort of, you know, initiatives is it's not something that anyone should expect someone to do in their free time. It should be paid work or at least accounted for work and time. Um, another barrier I would say was probably, um, so it, it's, it's both a barrier, but it's also an op op opportunity is duplication, right? So do your research. There's going to be in the not-for-profit sector, make sure there are not other people that are doing exactly what you're doing. And if there are people that are doing something very similar to what you're doing, how can you collaborate with them? How can you make sure that you are sharing your resources and space? And that can get really political as well, but I just find it very um, un- it's, it's just very inefficient the way that there's so much duplication in the field and often there is competition over collaboration when we're all supposed to be helping people and we're supposed to be creating social impact and good. So I think one of the barriers that I came across and it's still, you know, it's still something that I am learning or trying to figure out how to solve the best way is how do we collaborate more effectively um, because right now collaboration can be quite transactional. Sometimes it's been really good and we've, you know, we've collaborated with organizations like Headspace, we've collaborated with um, other not-for-profits, with the Edmund Rice Centre, with so many other people that are doing similar work to what we're doing. And even like between the three of us, we're doing quite similar work, but in different angles, right? So finding collaborate, collaborators and collaboration is a huge strength. Um, and can help sustain the momentum of a project far beyond sort of what you on your own can do. Um, and then the other barrier um, is just the nature of the work it's going to get. I think when you start out, you're passionate about it. You love it. It's the thing that you, you know, care most about. But five years, in, four years into it, six years into it, you start to not like it as much as when you first started doing it, which is, which is really sad. Um, but to me, I took that as a sign that I needed to move on. So it was obvious to me that me being there with my kind of, my, with my tiredness was not helpful to the overall impact of the project. 
And it was understanding that we needed new energy, we needed new creativity, new passion. And then, so I guess being really honest um, and sometimes your sort of, your personal sense of um, entitlement or, or not even entitlement, just wanting to cling on to the thing that you really love can stop you from seeing what's, what's best for the project, what's best for the people that are connected to the project, because it's always going to be so much bigger than you, right? So you have to have, you have to be really honest with yourself and you have to be really honest with the toll that it's taking in your life and making those decisions when you need to make those decisions. Um, and the way that I, I think the one thing that I would recommend anyone to, to support you in that moment is to have mentors. So have mentors that are connected to your work, who know what you're doing, but who are also disconnected. So who can look at it from like a more objective point of view and go to those mentors when you need to make those big decisions. So you have support around the decisions that you make. Yeah, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> so much advice. Thank you so much, Finale. And I know, especially when discussing money and funding, it does get quite dicey and often we're not necessarily sharing our resources with each other. So thank you very much for highlighting especially such a stigmatised and a, quite a bit of an issue across the not-for-profit space. Um, finally, Nelly, I might pass to you. You spoke briefly about how COVID-19 had impacted um, How's Your Health and being developed into what you had originally projected for it to be. What are some, or what is the biggest issue actually that you faced in establishing um, How's Your Heart during the peak of COVID-19 and how did you mitigate this issue? Um, I think for us, we had a bit of a reverse problem. I know a lot of um, people when they first start, um, like Shanali said, it's where do you look for resources? Where do you look for funding? Um, for us, we had the resources, we had the funding that was given to us and then it was like, well, how are we still supposed to use this um, effectively during COVID times? Um, that was that was, I think, one of our biggest challenges. Um, you know, using resources that um, are so precious um, and making sure that it's reaching out to the community effectively. But I think one of our other biggest challenges was. Um, the engagement that we initially got. Um, our very first in-person consultation that we had, we went all out for it. And I think we only had, we had a lot of registrations and of those registrations, I think we only had three people show up. Um, and so us being the hopeful people that we were, we were like, oh, we'll hold it off a little bit longer and, you know, maybe more people will start showing up. Um, and no one did. And that was fine, um, you know, for the team, it was an opportunity to have a practice run and better polish our skills. So I think for anyone who is starting out, um, you know, if you do run into challenges like that, don't be, um, don't be disheartened so quickly because it, things like that will happen. Um, and, you know, a lot of the times people express interest and they won't show for a number of reasons, but there's also so many things that are happening in the community, especially now, um, that people just sometimes don't have the time to go or sometimes they're a little bit um, cautious of, you know, what, what is it? And once they see that something's up and running properly, then they'll start to show engagement. And that's definitely something that we saw. Um, so at our next event, I think we had 20 to 25 people to show up. Um, and then from there at our third event, we had um, over 40 people show up and people still showing up who hadn't registered being like, can you please let us in through the door? Um, so yeah, and then moving that to something that was online, um, that was that was quite tricky because for us, it was like, okay, well, we've put in this work now and we've built this community. We've got young people who are engaged. Are we going to lose all of that now by transitioning online? Um, and thankfully we didn't. And we had a lot of support from um, other non-profit organizations who um, were still, you know, really pushing out the stuff that we were doing um, and making sure that our name and branding was out there. Um, and we, I suppose as young people, it was a bit of an advantage as well because we were able to utilize social media platforms and, you know, do Instagram lives and um, interact with young people during what would have been quite a stressful time. Um, so yeah, yeah. Awesome, thank you so much, Nelly. 
Um, I have definitely watched the growth of How's Your Hal over the period of time and I'm very proud of the initiative that comes to, um, especially in terms of destigmatizing and recognizing the taboos across multiple different cultural communities. So I truly do thank How's Your Hal for that. Um, we're coming to the end of the Q&A, but before we do finish the Q&A, I might just pass to all three of the panelists to give us a bit of advice, especially to our audience members today on how they will empower or what advice they can give to other people of color, multicultural people wanting to establish or start their own business. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be business related because I do recognize that Ash Finnelli and Shinali are not only um, multicultural business leaders, but they're leaders in every aspect of their life. Um, I've had the privilege of watching all three continue to create changes across multiple different communities. And I think beyond their expertise as multicultural leaders within their businesses, they are leaders within the community, leaders across Western Australia. Um, so I might pass to you, Ashwin, to give us a piece of advice. I think um, what Shanali sort of said earlier is that it's just so important to collaborate with people. So yes, you may be passionate about this idea, um, but the fact that you're passionate about it means there are probably a lot of other people out there who are really passionate about it as well. Um, and if nothing really exists about it, it means because no one's really taking that step. So I just, like your burnout's absolutely, if you're doing it all by yourself and you think it's your responsibility to make sure this project gets off the ground, um, it doesn't have to be the case at all. Just reach out, reach out in whichever ways you can. I mean, for us, it was looking on Facebook and just looking up men's mental health and then sending messages to other people in that space and be like, hey, we have an idea about this. And then seeing if they want to, you know, just meet up for a coffee and, or be a mentor or anything like that. So I guess the, the main advice is, find out what that area is that you're passionate about and then just Google search everyone else who, who's in that area and see who you can get ideas from and see who you can get support from. Beautiful. And that was what I was going to say. <laughs> um, maybe I'll add to that. So I was going to say make friends. You have to be, you just have to make friends with lots of people, but also make friends with people you wouldn't usually make friends with is maybe what I would say. And when I say make friends, I mean, um, you know, go out there and sort of talk about your idea and introduce it to people but also don't I think I think people often think of networking and they don't actually bring themselves to it they're just at a professional level and they're just sort of like this is my name this is what I do um I need money and that's I think that you really can really connecting with people on an emotional on a social level where you are actually making friends and you care about what they think um it, it helps to take you that step further, building actual relationships with people that are not just there for, you know, transactional sort of money business um, for you to use for those reasons. Um, and yeah, it's really important to take your idea to places that you don't. So yes, go to all the other people that are doing similar things, but also go to people who are doing something completely different to you, you know, go to um, a footy club that might not, with the boxing, for instance, go to footy clubs that, um, like an all men's footy club that doesn't, doesn't from the outside seem to care at all about women's empowerment and talk to them about it and see what they do. Sometimes you'll get rejected, but it's actually really interesting when there are collaborations between organisations that wouldn't you wouldn't expect to collaborate and really cool things come out of that so make friends with people you wouldn't usually make friends with beautiful to add on to that I would say um know your worth you know a lot of young people put a lot of time um, and passion and energy into these projects and more often than not um, especially with us with How's Your How you know we had really big organizations who would come to us and be like okay can we have some of your young people do x y and z for us um, and when we said you know what is it you'd be able to offer these young people in return they're a little bit st stunned and they're like oh well, why should we offer anything in return um, and I think that's where it can become a bit of an issue you know young people are constantly doing um, a lot of work for free um, and giving out a lot of um, resources that they've worked on um, and things that they've put countless hours and a lot of passion into and consistently doing that, you know, with nothing in return. I'm not saying that you always have to have anything in return, but consistently doing it with nothing in return, it leads to a lot of burnout because you're going above and beyond for all these other people. Um, and, you know, a lot of times for um, a lot of other organisations, 
um, and to con continuously be putting um, time and effort and passion into it and not getting anything out of it, it can lead to a lot of burnout. Um, and I don't think a lot of young people or anyone starting out realises that initially. Um, and I'd also say seek out, you know, support and help. I think sometimes when people start something up, they feel this pressure of having to have it all figured out and knowing the ins and outs of, you know, what it is that they're working with. And it's okay to not know the ins and outs of it all, you know, back to front. Um, seek out support, seek out help, you know, um, and be quite open and upfront with people and say, look, I haven't gotten this aspect of it figured out. How do you think I can best go about it? Um, because it can be it can be quite draining, you know, having that immense amount of pressure to feel like you've got this passion project and, you know, to have it all figured out and present it to someone and be like, yep, this is what I've got and it's flawless because it, it's going to take, you know, sometimes even a year or so to iron out all the teething issues and um, have it be you know, completely the way you want it to be. Beautiful advice. Thank you so much, Nelly. Um, that ends and concludes the portion of the question and answer segment. So we're going to jump into a little Q&A with the audience. Now we have had quite a couple of questions come through and I don't think we have enough time for all of them. Um, so I have picked out two questions that I do want to ask you both. And I think it would be good for you, for all three panellists to answer both um, because they are quite short and simple. But we do have a question coming in from Apu, which says, um, how do you balance full-time work and study and whilst owning a business and taking care of yourself too, especially the initial stage of a business where engagement might be a barrier? Now, I recognise that um, whilst some of the panellists at the moment aren't necessarily actively working with the initiatives at the current moment, um, I do want to recognise that regardless the element of self-care plays a major role in actively progressing and actively achieving those um, great results across the community. And I do recognise that all three panellists also do quite a bit of work in the not-for-profit space regardless. So I think this is a good question for um, you three to answer. But I also did want to add in a fun little question um, asked by Zoom user, which says, what are some other local multicultural businesses you love supporting? And I think in light of Harmony Week, it is super important to shed light on amazing initiatives across the Western Australia community. Um, so, Shanali, I might pass to you first. Sure, it's always a difficult question. I think I'm getting better at balancing things, but I still don't think, still working on learning how to balance everything. Um, I think kind of going back to what I said before about really being honest with yourself. So at the start, when I first started, I would just say yes to everything and um, and it wasn't even because I wanted to please people. I genuinely wanted to do it all. I'm such an optimist. And I was like, I want to do that and that and that. Um, but then really having to be honest with my capacity, with recognizing what my capacity was and also being honest about, you know, taking up space that I could be giving to someone else or I could be letting someone else take the lead there. Um, so being honest and also sometimes that can be really scary because it can be, you know, realizing that actually you have to take a break or you have to ask for help or you have to get someone else to step in. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that it's easy to say, be honest, but the consequences that come after that can be quite scary. Um, and so the second thing that I would say to go along with that is to have really good friends supporting you. So I was really lucky in that the boxing project we, we were a group of young people and, you know, a group of young women working together. So there was this sort of, I guess, dynamic where if one of us needed to take a break, there was always, I would always get so much energy from the group of us. And the moment that you start to feel alone, that's when you know that something's not right, you know? So making sure that you're always nurturing those relationships. And, and obviously friendships aren't, they're not just there and without any work so there's work involved in making sure that you're taking care of your friendships and your relationships but prioritizing that because they're going to be the support they're going to be the net that holds you if everything goes belly flop you know so 
I think from the start, prioritizing your friendships and relationships and making sure that you're, you've got a good support network, no matter what happens, you've got a support network to take care of you. Um, and then I just tried lots of different combinations. You know, I did full-time work for a while while trying to do boxing as a volunteer. I did boxing as my main work while trying to study and do lots of other different kinds of things. So I think you have to be willing to take risks and try things and sometimes, and, and also know when it's not working, you know? So um, yeah, I hope that helps. I, I still feel like I'm figuring out the balance though, but um, also going back to what Nelly said before, know your worth. So don't, don't deprioritize yourself um, and actually your health and well-being is so important. And also recognizing that we live in like a high stress, in high stress times you know so just because something might have been achievable or you might have thought it to be achievable five years ago doesn't mean we live in the same landscape now so you have to sort of reprioritize, rethink about the landscape that you're living in um so yeah just taking care of yourself by being honest by making sure that you're having like safe and healthy relationships around you um and also just coming back to your health and well-being being priority, you know, just re regardless of, you can't do any good in the world if you're not well. So you have to, you just have to prioritize that. Um, multicultural businesses that I would give a shout out to. Um, I just want to like bring up my Instagram feed and like read off, read off all the, the people doing cool things. I think there's just so many, um, young businesses so if you you know look up uh Perth Makers Market or you look up um what are the other I, I just find a lot of um people doing really cool small businesses through different markets and events um the Propel Youth Arts uh festival is another way that I often find young people doing cool things um the more there, there are lots of big organizations that are doing sort of like multicultural initiatives, but more and more I feel drawn to young people like doing their own thing, you know, opening up their own Etsy or um, starting their own business and wanting to support that. So um, let me let me go on my Instagram and I'll type a few in, in the chat box if that's OK. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Shanali. And I'm looking forward to your list in the chat below. Um, Ashvin, might pass over to you. Yeah, I think Sean covered that pretty perfectly in terms of how to balance things. I think the, the main key word is no one really has it figured out in terms of how to balance things, but just trying different combinations, similarly uh, doing full-time study or taking a few units off or you know missing a semester here or there. Um, you'll sort of find what works for you. I, I think it might be a bit different if you're sort of by yourself running this initiative. Um, I mean, so I'm talking more from like a team-based example. When we started, there was four of us. Now we work in a team of 11. So a big part of that saying yes to everything is one side of it is because you actually want to do everything and um, you're really passionate about doing everything. But the other side of it is in the early days, you were doing everything and it's very difficult to let go as well. Um, I think that's that's something we, we kind of find out. We're like, oh, like I may as well just do it myself. I know how to do it anyway. Um, but I think it's super important to actually just trust the other people in your team and be like, no, like, I'm going to get much better at delegating and be like, I know like everyone has their time to, to do that kind of grunt work. Um, and the, le the, the less I can do it, the better um, in that sort of saying where even though you may want to be, the, be the, like the nice guy and take all the work on, you're actually not really helping the rest of the team if you're just drowning yourself and all that and you can't really give them your best. So yeah, that's all I really add to sort of trying your best. Also Google Calendar, that's the best thing ever. Different colors on Google Calendar is so good. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to do without it. So those are the only sort of two things I'd add um, to organizing your time. In terms of um, shouting out other local businesses, sort of a recent one that I've come across is called Zentient. Um, they're really, really cool. They're super new. I'll type the name in later once I figure out the spelling. Um, but essentially they offer like tech solutions to companies, um, but they promote the whole idea of like a healthy workplace. And then the profits they get from those tech solutions, they provide free mental health first aid training to organizations um, and we're super lucky that you know later on this year that will be so a big part of us sending our volunteers around to schools and to rural WAs we really want them to be mental health first aid trained for some of the things that might come across in the sessions um, and it's not very cheap um, sometimes it can cost $300 a head 
Um, so they're, they're, letting, they're doing that for free for our, for our volunteers, which is incredible. So yeah, I think if, if that was ever something you were interested in having um, in your space, um, I know they're, they're really, they get a big kick out of giving mental health aid first aid training to non-for-profits. So Zentian are great. Thank you so much, Ashwin. Nelly? Um, I think, yeah, a, a lot of what I was going to say um, has been reflected by Shanali and Ashvin. Um, I think what I would add to that is, um, like they've said, it takes a lot of trial and error to try and, you know, balance it all and um, figure out what works for you. But I think in terms of self-care is knowing when to step back um, and knowing when to say no. Um, much like Shanali, I initially was like saying yes to everything because um, I was passionate about it all um, and it's you know all good and well to be passionate about lots of different things but it's also important to recognize you know when your plate is full and when um, you have to say no and step back um, and yeah I agree with Ashwin on delegating I for so long was that person that was like oh no I think I can do this good so I'm just going to do it myself um, but yeah being able to trust other people being able to trust your team um, and delegating um, is really really important um, having a good support network around you always helps um, and being able to you know check in with yourself as much as we can check in with other people being able to check in with yourself and say okay um, you know, how am I feeling? How am I going? Um, I think that's really, really important. Um, in terms of small businesses that I would shout out, I, there's been a lot on um, Instagram that I've seen that I have saved. Um, none of them come to my head straight away. So I think I'll have to pop it into the chat um, because, yeah, there's so many and a lot of people are doing so many, uh, a lot of amazing work as well. Honestly, Nelly, I think that ties in this, that ties this panel together so perfectly. Um, there's so many multicultural young people doing amazing things. And I think especially during Harmony Week, it is so important to celebrate and recognise the growth and the impact that these people are making across Western Australia. Um, this comes to the end of our panel discussion. And I do want to thank Shanali, Nelly and Ashvin for their time today, speaking to us and providing a wealth of knowledge to our audience members. Um, you've all touched me. And I think that Multicultural Week, Harmony Week is a perfect time to recognize um, the incredible impact that young leaders like yourself are making. So I thank you all so much, not just for providing me and the audience members for advice, but for continuously working towards creating a more inclusive and equitable Western Australia. I might pass over to Jen to just quickly end this panel discussion, but once again, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think Zara, you've summed it up perfectly. That was like, wow. <laughs> um, and I'd like to also thank you, Zara, because you facilitated such an incredible conversation um, and panel discussion. Um, I'm going to get you, everyone in the audience to quickly, um, well, invite you to turn your microphones and your cameras on and we'll give the panelists a really big clap. So let's see, we'll see if this works. Let's change it to gallery. Um, but yeah, you can, let's just congratulate them all together. <laughs> well done. Um, just a couple of things before we, before we say bye to you all today. Um, I also want to say a massive congratulations to you, Zara, for your recent award. So Zara um, has recently been awarded the um, WA Young Multicultural Person of the Year for 2022. Have I said that correctly? Yeah, so congratulations, Zara. Um, and we're so grateful and we feel so lucky to have had you as part of the team to facilitate this incredible event. And thank you all to, to all of our audience members for coming along and sharing this special event with us today. We'd love you to keep in touch with us. So I might also pop something in the, in the chat, um, just our social links, how you can stay in touch with Murdoch Launchpad. We've got lots of events coming up, um, a few online as well. So if you're anywhere in the world, you can join us. And we also, if you're a Murdoch staff member or a student, you can access free business consultations with our entrepreneurs in residence. So if you've got a, it could be a business or an initiative that you want to get up and running, but you're, you know, stuck or not sure how to get started, 
you can book in a free consultation with us um, and or 